itself. Uh, one way to do it is use the same algorithm and then probabilistically encrypt all the data. So all variables are going to be ciphertext now. The entire table is going to have a ciphertext of the key and the value, and the user is going to provide the ciphertext of the input. Now, your equality function should return the encryption of zero or the encryption of one, and you run in your first problem. Uh, you want to implement something that uh, corresponds or has the same context as multiplication, but your input is ciphertext now. And you also want to do the same thing for addition. And one way to solve that is to use homomorphic encryption. Homomorphic encryption allows you to manipulate ciphertext in a meaning in meaningful way. And in this example, let's say we have plain text values 5 and 7. If we encrypt them homomorphically, we'll get two ciphertexts. We apply a special function over those ciphertexts we get a ciphertext result, and if we decrypt that, in this case, we will get the addition of 5 and 7, which is 12. And there are two types of homomorphic encryption schemes. There are fully homomorphic schemes that allow you to do both addition and multiplication, and some uh, consider those schemes impractical uh, today. And they, most of them follow the original Gentry blueprint from 2009, and there are uh, more variants appearing every day. The other option is to use partial homomorphic schemes that only support one operation, for example, addition in Pellier, and these are significantly faster uh, compared to fully homomorphic. Now, the big problem is how can you use a partially homomorphic scheme to also add a simulation of the second operation. So in CryptoLeq, uh, we build an entire stack that consists of this new language that has a native arithmetic operation which is homomorphic to subtraction. And we also add a heuristically obfuscated function we call G. And this function essentially allows you to do something that's homomorphic to multiplication using all these ciphertexts. And it acts as an encryption oracle. And finally, we also added a new compiler that allows you to uh, do high-level programming so that you can write your own programs. We added secure libraries. And currently, we have a C++ emulator. And the future plan is to also make special hardware. And uh, the source code is available currently in our GitHub page, uh, github.com slash momalab. Now, very quickly, uh, just uh, a few additional details just to motivate you to come and join me outside. Uh, CryptoLeq is using a single instruction abstract machine that uses three arguments, A, B, and C. These are essentially the references of a program counter. And all you do essentially is you update the second uh, dereference, which is B, by loading uh, uh, two corresponding dereferences, applying an update function, storing the result back, and then updating the program counter. Essentially, we have these four operations, load, store, update, and jump, which are the basic operations to do during complete computation. And in details, uh, O1 operation is just a modular inversion and modular multiplication, and O2 is a subtraction and a, subtraction and a division, and this lack operation is just a comparison with zero. And this is what the uh, re-encryption oracle uh, looks like. Essentially, is an exponentiation or an exponentiation and multiplication. So finally, we just compare this with a fully homomorphic library. Uh, of course, it's not uh, an apples-to-apples -apples comparison because a crypto leg is a programming language and it has an execution engine and a dedicated compiler, whereas Helib is just a mathematical library. But uh, our results show that the average cost uh, of crypto leg additions is about five orders of magnitude, faster than the average cost of Helib additions. And this is due primarily to the bootstrapping cost that Helib has. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope you join me at the poster session. And
So now everything what I'm saying is loud. Uh, I'm <laughs> muted now. Okay. Good.
We learned it at the end of the second time. How did you set the slides up? So it's now, now, now it's free screen, it's okay. Um, I moved it on the other side. Oh, and then, then full screen. All right, welcome uh, back to the last session for the day. Uh, there has been a switch. So we're going to have the session, I don't remember the title. Of coding and game theory. Game theory and coding, yes. Uh, instead of the multimedia analysis one, that's going to be tomorrow at the same time. So we have very, uh, three very interesting talks. The first one by Tobias Echtering on polar code for secure Windows Z coding. So you have a microphone or are you going to... I have one here. Oh, okay, thank you for introducing me. Thank you for coming. So I'm the coding uh, presentation. And... Uh, the, the work is a joint work with uh, my PhD student, uh, Min Tan, and uh, uh, Mika S. Koklund, and it's uh, polar coding for secure wine as if uh, settings. So the motivation is quite generic. Uh, we start with saying that, okay, for big data, it's too big to be stored uh, uncompressed. We would like to compress it. And additionally, we would like to control um, the information leakage if, if the storage gets... Uh, uh, compromised, so that uh, brings us to secure source coding. And as one of the prototype settings uh, for source coding, we would like to look at the setting with uh, side information. So um, side information at the receiver side, and this is a classical wine as if setting. So then we end up with uh, secure source coding for the wine as if setting. And then the the uh, additional part of the title is polar coding. So we are actually interested in finding efficient coding mechanism uh, which achieve the uh, fundamental bounds, the uh, information theoretic fundamental bounds. And there were recently uh, lots of progress in uh, the design of polar codes. So we thought that, okay, um, this is a prototype setting, one of the basic settings in information theory, plus uh, the security aspect, which fitted to a project which is uh, supporting this. Um, so let's have a look if we can design polar codes for this uh, setup. So the setting. Um, this is a yeah, the laser pointer. So Xn is the source. Um, and YN is a correlated uh, source or side information on the receiver side. So N means the encoder on the, on the transmitter on the uh, transmitter side, and DEC is a decoder on the receiver side. And uh, the, the source will be encoded in a message, and this message then, for instance, uh, get stored in a, in, a, in a storage. And then we have an eavesdrop, and my student likes to call the eavesdropper not Eve, he calls the Eva. Um, and the eavesdropper in this setting also has uh, some side information, uh, it's EN, and uh, we measure the, the leakage by the uh, entropy, uh, entropy rate, and it actually is, uh, um, so we have here the message, which is uh, intercepted, we have here the, uh, the side information at the eavesdropper, so we measure here the uncertainty at the, uh, at the, adver at the adversary, at the eavesdropper, about the source, uh, yeah, and this is, this is which we would like to control additionally to the classical Weiner zip setting. So uh, this setting has been studied by uh, Villiard and Piantanida and has been published in the Transaction of Information Theory in 2013. Um, but, uh, okay, one more. This is uh, about how this has been studied. So one looked at it, the uh, rate distortion equivocation region. So we are looking at, uh, that we would like to find for every epsilon, uh, we would like to look or we want to define uh, something achievable, an achievable code for a given block length n, if we can make the message set size uh, arbitrarily uh, close to the rate r, um, if we can make the average distortion of the reconstruction, um, here's the average distortion of the reconstruction on the decoder side arbitrarily close to uh, the d, and additionally, now in the secure wine as if setting, we also say that the uncertainty at the eavesdropper about the source should be um, arbitrarily close or larger to a delta. So we want to control that uh, the eavesdropper is not uh, learning too much about the, uh, um, the source. Then, as usual, the set of all possible uh, achievable uh, rate distortion equivocation pairs is then called the, 
uh, rate distortion equivocation region. So the region here then defines the fundamental trade-off, which cannot be uh, beaten. Okay, and um, Villiard and Piantanida, they have studied exactly this problem, and they have characterized in a single letter description the uh, rate distortion equivocation region. So they say that um, the, uh, the rate cannot be made smaller than uh, this mutual information. Um, the distortion has to satisfy this constraint, and here we have the uh, additional equivocation uh, constraint. And um, the X is a source, the Y and the E are the side information at the legitimate and the uh, adversary, and U and V are auxiliary random variables for the code design. Um, and the difference to the wine as if is that we add another layer to the coding. And here we have the decoding functions. In their proof, they, um, the proof is based on classical arguments on the uh, um, using jointly typical encoding and decoding. And this is now actually our motivation. So this, um, this uh, the drawback of jointly typical uh, encoding and decoding is it is actually uh, only a proof of existence that there exists a code, but it's not a constructive proof how to find such a code. So we could do a brute force search, so it's not easy, so it's uh, very tough to find such a, uh, uh, such a code book. And even if we succeed with finding such a code book, it's also unstructured, um, which means that uh, the complexity, if one would implement it, is also uh, unreasonable. So random coding proof of fundamental bounds are nice, but they're not really constructive. Alikan in 2009 was coming up with a code construction uh, called polar coding, which was uh, a systematic design of codes for the point-to-point -point channel. And um, so this was, a, was a really a breakthrough, um, the design of such, polar, uh, such codes, because now uh, these uh, codes were, were achieving the fundamental bounds, and it was a constructive design. It was even uh, with a reasonable complexity. The drawback was that uh, it was a still an asymptotic optimal performance, and the n, the block lengths, had to be very large. And then still, if this is a complexity and n becomes very large, it was still not really practically relevant. But um, recently, so in 2011 and 2012, these two papers came up and there were extensions of the polar code design, list decoding and cyclic redundancy check, uh, added decoding of polar codes. These are really breakthroughs because now the code designs based on these concepts and additional concepts, they beat state-of-the-art turbo codes, LDPC codes. So they are really um, that good that they are already two weeks ago accepted in the, um, in the 5G standard. So for the control channel in 5G, um, polar codes are going to be used. So, uh, yeah, but, um, sorry? Yeah, the main competition was for the uh, payload, for the data, but they didn't uh, have designed the, uh, um, the, uh, the retransmission scheme for the, for the polar code event. So I, I agree the main competition would have been more if it was always also used in 5G, but considering that it was developed in 2009 and the shortage in uh, the development of the codes is, uh, I think, quite impressive. So now they become more popular since they were invented and also more recently here are some uh, related um, secure source or channel coding problems focusing on secure aspects. So about uh, nested polar codes for wiretap channel and relay channels, or we have here the uh, secrecy capacity of the wiretap channel. Um, myself, I'm also involved in this one with uh, confidential messages. These are also all channel coding problems. And uh, so here we have lossy compression setting and there are many, many other um, uh, code designs uh, coming up uh, in, the, in the latest. So now here in this talk, in this paper, we actually looked at the uh, secure Weiner ZIF setting. And uh, this, the, this is the main result of the paper. So every triple, the rate distortion equivocation triple in the rate distortion equivocation region can be actually achieved with polar codes. And... Um, 
the, the construction of the polar codes uses uh, is, is, can be uh, easiest developed, I think, uh, if, one, if one looks at the channel coding concepts or principles. And after identifying the relationships in the code design, um, it's, uh, it's more or less a straightforward analysis. Or you can use the, the, the machinery which is available to, uh, to do the analysis and prove that uh, you can actually achieve this, uh, this triple. So let's have a look a little bit more to it. So it, the construction follows the, the jointly typicality proof. So uh, again, it is a superposition encoding with two layers. Uh, we will have, uh, we will, uh, the side information at the receiver allows to reduce the communication rate, which is uh, the, the, the binning uh, effect. And um, the UN is actually the cause layer. It uh, turns out in this setting that the eavesdropper is able to resolve uh, this, this code word with the own side information EN. And VN is the refinement layer, which is not going to be resolvable by the eavesdropper. So on this slide, I try to illustrate the polar code. Um, so I will have a, some time to look at it. Uh, so the code words, we, we only look at the design of the, the cause layer, the U, and uh, the code word sets are actually obtained from the polar code transformation. So the U and here are the, uh, uh, if you want, uh, and look at a channel coding setting, the U and are the, uh, the data, the G and is, uh, is the, or U and is a message, G and is the transformation, so that we end up with a code word U and tilde. And uh, the GN itself is, is actually uh, um, a matrix which is obtained after lock and Konecker products of this uh, uh, basic uh, building matrix G2. Um, and then the effect which is in the polar code design is that it so happens that if this is now communicated as a code word over a channel, we will, we will face that some of the U and on this side here, the without tilde, uh, become or will face a perfect channel and some of them will face a, a useless channel. So uh, that means that some of these bits can be communicated uh, with uh, almost uh, no loss and some of the bits uh, will be, uh, will be uh, random on the receiver side. Um, so the channel coding interpretation now would be that U and denotes as I said before, the raw bits, U tilde is a code word, and XN, the source in, the, in our problem, can be seen as a channel output of a memoryless channel where the U is the input. So the U is the input and X is the output, or the U tilde in this uh, case, so we would, uh, enter, we would, of course, transmit the code word. And then if we look at it like this, then the encoder in our problem corresponds to a channel coder, decoder at, of, the, of a polar code. Um, and then we can identify the same effects as in the channel coding problem, the polarization. So we can split up the whole block into different parts. So some bits, um, here these ones, A, U, they are actually carrying information and they will face a perfect, perfect channel. These will be a description of the source. Some bits are actually deterministically determined by the other um, by, the, by the other bits in the code word, and some bits are random. And since these random bits uh, cannot be uh, concluded on the receiver side, uh, we, pre we have to agree on both sides, on the receiver and the transmitter, so we have to agree on those bits, and therefore they are called frozen bits. Now, since we have side information, from those bits which we have to communicate, to tra transfer the information, some of these bits can be concluded using the side information. So we don't have to communicate all the bits which we have to transfer. We only have to communicate those bits. So those bits are uh, then uh, transmitted. So this is then corresponding to the message which is going to be sent. And those bits need to be recovered on the receiver side. Um, this is for the cost layer. And similar steps can be done for the refinement layer, which is modeled by VN. And then for this one, we, need to, we, we take Xn and Un as the channel outputs 
And we, we do exactly the same, but now we have uh, this as our uh, channel output, and we have such a memoryless channel. Here's once again um, the encoding and decoding. So if uh, a bit is in this set, it uh, actually can be uh, deduced from, or it is a descriptive bit of the, of the source description. So we, uh, we, we take this uh, according to this distribution. If a bit is corresponding, or the index is corresponding to this deterministic set, uh, almost deterministic set, uh, the bit is chosen from the others, from the other code word entries. And um, on the decoder side, we have to now include, uh, we have to also look at the, the setup uh, that not all bits are communicated. So if a bit is within BU, this was uh, the set which we decided to be, uh, uh, which will be recovered by the side information. Um, then we have, a, we have the side information and the, the previously uh, decided bits, which allows us to conclude on the, on the next bit. If the bit is in the deterministic set, it, is, um, it is, can be concluded from all the other previous uh, code word bits. And then we have uh, remaining bits, those which are frozen, which we have uh, fixed on both sides previously, and those which had to be communicated, which are carrying actually the information. Um, so noticeable here is that the encoding is actually uh, random encoding, and the decoding is uh, deterministic. So this is a construction of the proof, and now the main part of the paper is actually proving that uh, this, pro this construction of the code is achieving uh, the rate distortion equivocation tuple. So uh, we, we need to show that uh, for the code which we are aiming for, we can find this uh, set of frozen bits such that uh, the, the rate distortion and the equivocation is arbitrarily close uh, for sufficiently large, uh, large n. So um, the, the, the proof analysis is, is, as, uh, is, is as follows, so the overview. We have defined encoding and decoding maps as previously. Um, next, we, uh, for the proof, we are going to uh, look at the relationship, what um, statistics this actual proof is inducing and we relate it to a desired distribution for which we are going to be able to, uh, to prove the, uh, the, 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 the constraints. Um, so this is here, the distortion equivocation. Uh, um, so we, we show that it is bounded, and we show then proof that, that those uh, constraints, so coming close to the rate, distortion equivocation, are, are um, uh, achieved. And uh, then by the random coding arguments, in the end, we can argue that a set of frozen bits exists. So here, once again, the analysis. Uh, the key step is to, uh, to relate uh, the uh, induced distribution to an... Uh, so this, this is the ideal distribution which we are interested in, and we denote by p hat the induced distribution from the encoding and decoding process as proposed. And then it can be shown that the total variation between the uh, distribution which is induced by the code and the distribution which we are able to handle in the analysis for the constraints, that the total variation goes to zero as n uh, tends to infinity. So this allows us now to do the analysis of the bounds with respect to the desired distribution. And then afterwards saying we can make this one arbitrary close to the one and then we are Fine. So this is what is written here. This implies that the average distortion is uh, going to zero as n tends to infinity. And it's also uh, showing that the equivocation with the induced distribution is larger than uh, the equivocation. And here we have to subtract the transmission rate and we have an additional term which goes to zero uh, so that we, we have the, uh, we also ensure that the equivocation constraint is satisfied. We assume in our setting that the eavesdropper is aware of the frozen bits, and uh, later we can uh, then use the random coding argument to conclude that there exists a set of frozen bits or symbols such that the previous constraints exist. So this brings me to the conclusion. So um, the, the outcome or the, the theorem was 
that uh, the, we, we can actually achieve the wine as if uh, the secure wine as if set up with, uh, with polar codes. Uh, so the, the design, uh, can, we can find a design. Um, so small issues for the, for the direct implementation is you need to find the uh, frozen bit positions. Um, and uh, those depend uh, from uh, the source and the codebook distribution. That's not a big issue. Um, and, but uh, it's still of interest to find efficient methods to find those positions. Um, and uh, as, I, as I said previously, this, uh, this currently the, the hype that the, the polar codes are uh, now beating uh, the existing code designs uh, we also would like to do, do similar steps and transfer ideas to uh, come up with uh, efficient uh, encoding and decoding, for instance, including list decoding. So we are currently working on this. That's it. So thank you. Thank you. If there's any very quick question until Lutranian gets ready, uh, you can ask. Otherwise, anyone? Yes. And just, I mean, curiosity, because I'm not very expert in this. Oops. But what's the typical length of, uh, of these codes? Typical length of Typical the... length to achieve uh, close to capacity. Um, so for the, for the polar code and the original design, I actually don't know how far one has to go to be uh, here. <laughs> the problem is that um, uh, we, we end up with, still with bit errors. So you want to make the bit error as small as possible. And um, uh, the, to have a reasonable bit error performance, you have to make it uh, long. But with, uh, with the new developments, they work with uh, 1,024 bits. So it's always a power of two. But mm -hmm. uh, so for, for 1,000 of bits, thousand so very bits. short block lengths, I think. And uh, rather short, yes. Yeah, thank you. Let's thank the speaker again. Uh, second talk and third uh, from uh, Tuanian Zhu from New York University on solving large scale low rank zero sum security games of incomplete information. So the floor is yours. Skip the signal and when I see the. <laughs> All right. So um, uh, I think it's smart to, to just to sit, to stand here versus stand on stage because I cannot see what is on the screen. Oh. <coughs> I just pretend it's louder. Okay, it works. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, it's, it's, um, the date has, has to be different. Today is not December the 7th. Uh, this is deceiving. Um, and um, and what, what I'm going to do today is talking about solving a large-scale low rank on zero-sum security games. It sounds like there's a lot of information that says here. The first one is large-scale low rank zero-sum games, incomplete information. We try, we try to hopefully we're able to get to every one of them. So, um, so we start talking about what is the, uh, some introduction about uh, the games and uh, some of the classical approach when we have uncertainties. And then we are going to introduce how actually we can deal with uncertainties if a zero sum games in incomplete information. So well, let's start with the uh, um, decision making uh, and, and uncertainties in decision making in general. So when we have that, there are oftentimes a couple of uh, uh, approaches. One is looking at, let's say, if we have statistical uncertainties, let's say we have some uh, distribution about the uncertainties and we can do something with that. Or sometimes it's, it is deterministic uncertainty, meaning that we do not know what exactly it is. We know it is within a range. And information that is completely unknown. So sometimes we don't have any statistical or deterministic information regarding the entry. So these are information which is are completely unknown. And I mean, classically speaking, when you try to deal with in the context of games, um, which is inspired by a lot of uh, political philosophers, and like to say, say John Rawls, for example, and then John Hassani in 1967, and has to introduce the games with the incomplete information played by Bayesian players. He's tried to model players as a Bayesian person. So in other words, this is inspired by political philosopher John Rawls, and meaning that while you do not know who you are when you're making decisions, and then you and you can make decisions without knowing who, what type of person, black or white, and then, then hopefully the decision that you make is going to be just and fair. So this is the, uh, this is the insp inspiring 
in, in, in a context of uh, political philosophy. But then John Hassani tried to formalize it with it, uh, something that is more mathematical and looking at something called the Bayesian players. And mathematically speaking, Bayesian play, players having a standard, sort of standard methods to, uh, to look at games with the incomplete information. But, but the one thing is o o almost very uh, certain that you have to have some information, right, when it comes to Bayesian games. You have to have some statistical information about the behaviors of the, the players. So, um, so this is something that is a, not a very satisfying for us in the sense that while sometimes we may not even know uh, a, a lot of information, even the statistical information. So what we want to do here is we're looking at uh, games with um, different types of uh, uncertainties. And one type is, is that while you don't, even ha you, you don't even know the entry, well, obviously, you cannot make it into the Bayesian player. And also, sometimes, while you know some information about the player, but, but it's not the Bayesian type. So how we actually incorporate these, infer, uh, these types of uh, uncertainties into a non-classical Bayesian framework, or even not a Bayesian framework, it is something that we are looking at. So, and, and uh, here is a, uh, an example. For example, and, you know, this is uh, some people have studied uh, um, a robust linear programming, for example, and, um, and they are not looking at a Bayesian approach. Instead, for example, in, let's say this, matri uh, this vector A had, you know, has some uncertainty in the data. So what you're going to do, instead of uh, uh, looking at a Bayesian approach, you look at a robust approach. In other words, you're looking at minimization with respect to the worst case A, right? So this is a classical setting that people also know how to do. So uh, when it comes to games, um, I think I, I have probably is going to talk about a little bit about uh, uh, games again, as I did two days ago. It feels just like yesterday. Um, and we have to have four things here. So, and in this context, we are looking at players that are, uh, um, like, for example, the, 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 who are the players and what are the strategies and what are the payoffs. And uh, information, I think it's also very important, is what the players know in this context. So a classical game, which I just also mentioned two days ago, is the prison dilemma. And, uh, and it's a game where you, have conf you can confess and remain silent, and confess and remain silent. If both confessing, you get five years. If both remain silent, it's going to be one year. And, and we, we, we know from the tutorial um, from two, two days ago that let's say you are, are the, the prisoner A is confessing, and the prisoner B is definitely is going to, to uh, uh, confessing because having five years is better than 20 years in jail. And also, if somebody is remaining silent, if the prisoner A is remaining silent, and you are the person who is going to uh, uh, do confessing because zero is better than one year. So in other words, it doesn't matter what the other person is doing, you always choose to confess. And this has become a dominant strategy, and that's why there's a Nash equilibrium. So this is sort of the idea of behind a game type of analysis. And, uh, and this is a non-zero-sum game. So we are going to look at something that is similar, but in, in a zero-sum context. That means, uh, we have, again, you have the two players, and, um, and it's zero-sum, meaning that while it's not a win-win situation, it's a win-lose situation, meaning that if I win something, you're going to lose something. And the player one is minimizing its payoff, and the player two is going to ma maximize his payoff. And this payoff structure should be the same, because it's a win-lose situation. And the action sets, let's say, um, um, this is also classical thinking about this is a role player and this is a column player. Role player is choosing a role and a column pay player is choosing a column. And, uh, and you can see that the payoffs can be represented in a matrix. And information here is also, um, it's a complete information. In other words, everybody knows that they are playing against who and uh, you know the structure of this game. So everything here is common knowledge and this is the setup that we are working on. So, and, and this is just an example. I say if this matrix is, could be huge, right? Let's say this matrix is sitting down here and this uh, has, 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 a, uh, has a lot of uh, rows and it could be, have a lot of uh, columns here. And it's oftentimes happens in security games because thinking about, I'm trying to decide, uh, how we, let's say there are so, so many classroom here uh, for me to protect or patrol, and I try to ask myself which classroom I should patrol. So um, there's a lot of uh, a linear uh, combinatorics sitting down here. I can patrol just one of them. I can patrol, can patrol two of them, and there are so many combinations. Even though I have three people, but then I have two to the power of three, uh, three classrooms, and I have two to the power of three um, choices down there, right? So that definitely is going to, to lead to a large uh, uh, 
a number of actions down here, and, and similarly, you have a large number of actions to see down here. And this is why a large scale uh, games is actually as a natural result of uh, security games. So um, when it comes to something that is a classical, so we know that, well, we can look at upper value. Upper value is the min max value of the, uh, of the game, and lower value is the max mean of the game. And, uh, and we say the, uh, there is an equilibrium in the pure um, strategies when the upper value and the lower value are equal. But this is not always true. And, uh, and that, that's why we lead to a, a mixed strategy where instead of looking at a, uh, which row to pick, we look at what's the probability of you picking a row and what's the probability for you picking a column. And that's why you have upper value in the mixed strategies. So, so what we're going to do is um, that, well, the, the good thing about zero-sum structures and the mixed strategies is that now you actually can um, solve this game using a linear programming tools. So um, I think this is always exciting. When something is, you can show there's equivalence between a problem in linear programming, and this is always exciting, right? So there are many problems are like that, like MDP problems. So, but here, um, you, you can also solve this game problem, a zero-sum game problem, by formulating two um, a linear programming uh, problems. One is, one is here, which is looking at the strategy of the role player, and the other one is look at a column player, and at the end of the day, this V will be the same because that's going to be the value of the game, but the, the, the strategy has to, be, uh, has to normalize this Y using this V. So uh, these are uh, just a, 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 a probably the, the first, if you read a book, that probably are in the textbook uh, of, the, uh, of the game theory uh, uh, courses. So here, but what we want to do is we want to bring some complexities down here. So for example, let's like say the, the, and the entries, well, uh, just like what a lot of people complain, uh, we may not know, um, let's say this is what's the entry here. Well, may, it could be, well, uh, here is, is, is a cross. That means we completely do not know what it is. And, um, and here's three plus minus 0 0.2. That means, well, we know it's something around three, but we are not very sure. It could be plus minus something. So, and obviously we can also bring, bring in some Bayesian type of players. In other words, well, I, I mean, it may be zero is probability something. So these are all type of uncertainties that we actually can bring into just one single decision-making framework. Well, because we already know how to do the Bayesian, so well, I think what is really interesting for us is to actually move towards uh, these two type of uncertainties. One is um, the, the one that uh, you know something, but you do not know exactly what it is, but within a certain range. And the other type of uncertainty is that, what well, you just completely do not know what it is. So while you, while you have that, so you have um, you know, many ways to solve it. For example, uh, in, in, in the context of deterministic approaches, you can always be using a mini-max type of approach, like the robustness, uh, robust optimization type of approach to look at uh, uh, these type of uncertainties. And if you have Bayesian games, then you, have, you can look at a Bayesian type of uncertainties. And for these type of uh, uh, uncertainties, well, it seems you do not know anything. If you really want to do something, that you must have some extra information allow you to actually to complete this matrix. And this is where the, uh, the low rank uh, condition comes in. And why low rank is actually a good, a good assumption in here is oftentimes, well, thinking about when you have strategies which is like a of computorics nature. Something it is zero, 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 meaning that you don't do anything, and this is, a, you pick the first one, pick the second one, pick the third one, and, or, or pick both. So then most likely picking both is it's going to be dependent on uh, what's the result of picking um, this column and that column. So in words, it's sort of uh, there is a natural uh, dependence that, is a, that, that can be brought into this matrix. And also when the size of the action sets are not the same, for example, this is not a square matrix, but it's rectangular. So it also gives you a naturally a low rank structure. So, so what we want to do is, speaking of these two these different type of uncertainties, you're going to describe using two sets. So one is the UB, the other one is UC. So you're, you're going to describe these two sets. And looking at, um, um, maybe we can uh, describe it in this way. So we can relax this rank constraints by using some nuclear norm. 
and uh, the, you also relax this constraints, uh, re, re, uh, re, uh, rewrite these constraints by using this, this PA, which is basically says, if these are, the, these are the entries with these type of uncertainties, and then you are going to be bounded by this MIJ. So this is just a restating um, the problem here. So there are two type of methods that we can use. One is the non-robust method. The other one is the robust method. So robust method is actually very simple. A non-robust method is actually very simple. Uh, you know, you just have to complete the matrix first, and then based on what the solution of this, and then you're going to find what the strategies. So this is a sort of uh, uh, a simple approach to, to this problem. But what is more exciting to us is looking at the robust approach is thinking about, let's say, these are all the possible matrices that, that, um, that you can have. Now, among all these matrices, what is the worst strategy? I mean, uh, what is the worst possible outcome that we, we will be in terms of the mixed strategy equilibrium? So, and, and that would bring us to um, the, uh, the falling problem. So in other words, the going back to linear programming, so you are going to solve this linear programming, but, but now this A is going to be constrained by these two sets, right? So having said that, and how actually can we uh, go around and uh, solve this problem? So what we're gonna do is just like what we have, uh, uh, just uh, like the, uh, in the same spirit as the robust programming approaches. So uh, let's say we call these our columns, and, uh, and we also uh, say these are called these are rows of this matrix A. And then for the, um, uh, the, the first, the row player, and we have to solve this problem. And for every row, J, and uh, the similarly, you can uh, uh, formulate a similar problem for the, uh, uh, the problem for the, uh, the, the column player as well. So, and then this, this is going to allow us to rewrite this, um, uh, this object, the, the, uh, the linear programming problem into um, this nonlinear programming problem because of the constraints. And uh, here's the nuclear norm is upper bounded by something, which is one of the, the constraints. The other one is because of the other, or other entries may be uncertain uh, to some level. So what we're gonna do is that, well, this, this problem is going to be um, you know, this is the optimization problem we end up with. Now we want to find the dual of this problem. So, and, uh, and, and, um, and here, each, let's say KJ is the, uh, the Lagrange multiplier associated with this matrix A, and its YJ is the one associated with this um, um, uh, constraint. And then in order to find the, the dual problem, so we have to, I mean, we can split this, this problem into two parts. So first one is solving looking at this problem, and the second, which is this part, and the, the second part of the problem is, is, is right sitting right here, looking at this, because this is the uh, uh, W and A is or decision variable. Here is the reason that, that we wanted this A greater than zero is because of we have to make sure that this, this A um, is, has to be non-negative because that's, uh, that's the condition that we have to impose when you translate the game into a uh, uh, linear programming. So this is a natural constraint that we have to uh, put, in th uh, put in there. So I'm not sure we'll have to go through all the, the, the derivations here. So um, um, maybe, maybe, I mean, uh, maybe not, but, but let's, let's just, let, let's just, uh, just do a quick uh, uh, overview of this. Um, there are some facts about this nuclear norm, and then we're going to make use of this and substitute into the, uh, the first part of the problem. And then you do some uh, algebra, and you realize that, well, um, you actually can solve this problem and get some, prime, um, get some solution of this optimization problem. And then eventually, it's going to reduce to uh, a simply this optimization problem, which is it's a dual problem. And then if you look at the second part, you can also do some uh, reduction and eventually just become this part. So, which is also an easy uh, uh, expression of the second part of the problem. And then what is important here, I think, is just put, putting these two pieces together and you get to, you can reduce this problem into a, uh, a matrix-based uh, optimization problem, so YJ and uh, KJ, uh, these are the dual variables that you want to solve. And, um, and, and uh, these are the, uh, this is objective function sitting down there. And this is the dual problem of the primal problem. And, uh, and it can show that the primal is actually equal to the dual. Um, 
the, um, and here it is YJ and KJ, these are uh, matrices that we are uh, looking for. So eventually, um, you can um, write uh, the, this robust linear programming problem as the following problem. So you have this linear objective, and you have this as your constraint. And what's interesting is that, which I'm not going to show you, is that this actually can be written into a semi-definite programming problem, which is another convex optimization problem. So what I have said is I'm not trying to ask you to, uh, to understand what I'm going through, but just to try to tell you that what, I'm going, what I have gone through is just saying that we end up with a convex optimization problem, which is nice to solve. But still, you can say that, well, this complex, complex optimization problem could be of large scale. Think about this y could be a long vector. If you want to solve a long vector, and this is a, going to be a huge optimization problem, then you have to resort to some distributed optimization, and which is, could be enabled by a lot of techniques, So, which I'm not going to talk about right here. So, and similarly, you can talk about the, uh, the other player, which is, is going to be the same thing which I'm not going to go through, but this is, is going to be the entire big theorem that is, is going to appear in this paper. So what we're going to do is just show you an example. An example is actually very stylized. It's just saying, okay, you have four sensors and you decide which one to protect. And, um, and let's say this is, the, uh, this is the matrix sitting down there. Um, it's a very big matrix. You can, you can protect one sensor or you can protect all of them, but obviously there's a, there's a cost and a benefit is sitting down there. So, and this is the, uh, the, let's say this is the complete matrix, just a stylized example. And, and, um, um, and the, let's say there are, um, there are places, let's say there are entries that, let's say these entries we don't know, completely do not know what they are. And, um, and also on top of that, there are also uncertainties, even though for the entries that we know, and there are a lot of uncertainties down there. So in other words, we, let's say, let's pick this one. So we do not know it's 55, or it could be plus minus five. So once we have that context, then we can compare with the, these two um, uh, approaches. One is the robust approach. The other one is a non-robust non approach. The robust approach, I have to uh, find it here. The robust approach, uh, the original solution is given you by so one of these, um, uh, let's see, uh, it's, it's the, uh, the squares, right? The square dots here. And, uh, and the, the moment you have the robust, you can see that the, uh, the strategy that you found is actually not deviating too much away from the uh, dotted uh, solutions. But for the non-robust one, you can actually see that at the moment you start to complete the matrix and then you find a strategy, you actually realize that, wow, there is a huge deviation from the what is the solution you found by the non-robust solution versus the solution that you actually found through the uh, 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 a robust solution. You can actually see this uh, uh, robust solution seems to be, has higher fidelity uh, to the solution that you're looking for. So even though um, it is, it's the worst case solution, not exactly the original solution, but it still has a uh, 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 continuity sitting down there, which is nice for us. And, uh, and also, this is other thing that we can look at. You can also see, I mean, this is also an, an obvious way to investigate. Thinking about the, if you look at the uh, deviation from the solution that, that we know, which is the ground truth, versus the, uh, the percentage of entries that we do not know. Well, it's, it's in some ways intuitive that if the, the more unknowns sitting down there, so we have more errors that is going to occur. So, um, so in, in, in the... Uh, in the uh, robust solution sitting down there. So I think my time is, is, is almost there. Not almost there, I think it's already there. <laughs> Just being polite. Um, and, um, and here is the, um, um, and, and I think, I, 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 having said that, I think it's, uh, uh, I think the co conclusion is a, um, very self-evident in the sense that um, this, these are the, the, uh, the approach that, that we have used. But I think the essence is the following, is that um, it's a sort of way to address a lot of concerns people had about the games when you do not know what is going on. Let's say I have a matrix. I know uh, in the prison dilemma it's five years and five years, but probably in reality it is uh, five plus minus one year. So if that ha a situation happens, and what is going to be the way we can actually can solve these type of games. And why the analysis of the equilibrium is important is because the moment we know what is the equilibrium is, then we can start to know what's going to be the outcome 
um, in the future. If we know what the outcome in the future, we have a good prediction, then we can know what should we do for now in order to not go into the future or go into the future in a certain way. So having said that, um, that concludes my talk here. So we'll skip the questions because we're really behind time uh, and you can go forward. Yes. So it's 4.08 and the bus are supposed to pick us up at 4.15 oh, okay. in seven minutes. So if you can do it in six minutes, it's okay. If you can't, it's fine. Oh, no, let, me, let me do it. Oh, you should. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, 15 minutes would be great too. Okay. It will just, take some time. Just, uh, just pull me out of the stage. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll do that. <laughs> well, the, the next one, by the way, I have to say, uh, I'm just a messenger here for my students. So all the difficult questions should go to the students because they are, uh, the, they are the forces behind it. So I'm just a messenger. Um, and hopefully I do the good job carrying that message here and uh, do not make me uh, go over time. Um, so, so here, I mean, we're going to switch the gears and, uh, and talk about um, a little bit different. So, so he, this problem is looking at um, machine learning and the user perturbation. So the... The, uh, the rationale is the following. So thinking about there are so many devices and all these devices is going to provide you data and, and ask for data. And then there is machine learning which actually can reveal information. And what you want to do is to see uh, whether you actually can um, preserve some privacy for these machine learning algorithms. So there are a couple of things actually you can do. Um, so one thing that you can do is that you can add noise before you provide information. Or you can um, uh, rely on the machine learner, the learner, to add a noise for you. So, I mean, I, I give you a simple example. So, let's say I go to the airport, and uh, let's say I go to the uh, JFK airport, and uh, one day, I mean, I open the browser, and they ask me to uh, type in my name and my, my uh, email address. And I, then I was thinking, why, why they need to know my name? And what I got to do is I'm going to just say, um, my name is John Doe, and uh, my uh, my email address is 123 at gmail.com, for example. So I know because I don't really want to reveal my information, and they're not going to check it anyway, so then I got it connected to, to the Internet, right? So the reason I do that is because I have no trust um, in the, um, uh, the, the, the learner or the, the people who collect that information, and then I want to perturb my, uh, my, data, my, my data in an in, in automated way. So in other words, this is... Um, uh, so, so we would try to, uh, you can actually, this is a privacy issue which actually try to limit the access to the information about one person. So you actually can do it by yourself, or if you trust the person, actually he possibly, possibly can uh, perturb the data for you. So here is the, uh, um, uh, um, the setting that we were talking about. So there is a game between uh, the learner and, uh, let's like, see, the web browser, the service provider, for example, uh, versus the learner, uh, versus the user. So the user has, let's say we have n users, and these are, these are uh, uh, n data points. So, and these are the data points, let's say z, uh, xi and yi, these are the, uh, y is the label, and this xi is, is, the, is the feature vector, and, and the learner uh, perturbation is that while, when you submit the, the data, what you can do, you can actually add some noise on top of it, instead of telling people um, uh, your real name or your real address, you actually can uh, perturb it a little bit in a way. Now the question is, you know, how, what's the perturbation uh, you are going to add here? Are you going to add a lot? I say, add, people ask your age, you're going to say I'm 15 years old, or when I enter the form, I, say, I can say that I'm 90 years old. Uh, maybe you just try to confuse them. So is there like an incentive actually for me to do that? So um, this is the interesting privacy problem. So a lot of people probably do not know themselves. They probably just have to check the Google to realize. And, and one of the technology is that while you actually can download some of these plugins, so for example, Track Me Not and, uh, and these type of apps actually allow you to, uh, to change the data or try to avoid sending data to, uh, the, uh, to the browser. So this is the context that we have. So you have, let's say we are assuming the learning is some empirical risk minimization. And uh, here, what you do is, this is XI, this is your uh, data. What you want to do is to see whether you, uh, you want to add some 
noise so that you want to perturb the data so that the, the, this learner is trying to learn something by collecting the data from these players. So obviously, if you think about the following, um, if, the, if the accuracy is very important to both players, then the more, more uh, noise that you add, then here is going to increase a lot of errors in terms of accuracy. But, but obviously, there's a trade-off between accuracy and uh, um, uh, privacy, because when the moment you add more noise, then the learner probably does not really know um, what is your age and what's your address and what's your email address. So, and this boy, uh, brings us to something what we call the um, tragedy of the data commons. So tragedy of the commons means that when something is a common resource, then people start to underutilize it. So here is an interesting uh, analogy in a sense that um, when everybody think that way, then let's say everybody is not trying to pro uh, provide data, then you, well, you're not good able to learn anything. So if you're not going to be able to learn anything, it's not going to be good for everybody. So eventually, this is going to be an interest phenomena that we want to study here. So, um, so, that, so this is a looking at the interaction between multiple agents in, the, um, in, the, in their own self-interest and model and, and interaction between end users and uh, one learner. So a learner is going to do an empirical risk minimization, which is try to understand, we try to understand the ac accuracy loss, and differential privacy is try to understand the, uh, the privacy measures, the privacy uh, 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 utility that coming from this, um, uh, these problems. So there are two parts, right? So one is accuracy, and the other one is a privacy. So now the question is how are we gonna quantify them? So in terms of the uh, accuracy, so what we're going to do is looking at um, this optimization problem. So, so everybody is uh, learning. Um, the learner is going to collect the data and then uh, try to find, a, a, let's say, a classifier. And, uh, and then what we can see is that while we can actually, classi we can actually quantify the, uh, the accuracy by using uh, cer certain bounds here. So obviously, the, the more errors that you have, you are going to create more, uh, 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 more issues on, in terms of accuracy. So actually, this is the bound that we try to create here. So the, uh, uh, the more noise that you add on the learner and uh, the more noise that you add on, uh, from the, uh, the user, so they, together they're going to have an impact on the accuracy. And it's going to be normalized by the uh, number of players down here. So, and on the other hand, you also have a privacy issues. So the, uh, what we're going to take, uh, uh, the, the, the framework that we are going to make use of is, is a differential privacy framework. So again, we are going to make use of, the, uh, um, of the, the, some, some parameters in the differential privacy to quantify what do we mean by the utility that coming out of privacy. So here is the uh, differential privacy uh, definition, meaning that if I'm going to uh, perturb the, uh, the data, uh, this is our data set, if we are going to perturb the data set a little, uh, a little I mean, let's go into just one entry is being different. So how do I see in terms of the result? Do I actually can tell the difference? So, um, and this is the, gonna be a definition that we're gonna use and this epsilon P is going to quantify um, our uh, differential privacy. And if, obviously for a, a low values of uh, epsilon P sitting down here is going to represent a, a high level of uh, differential privacy. Think about this epsilon p is, uh, is, is very um, low, let's say uh, zero, so, so this term is gonna be equal to, to one. So, and, um, and what we're gonna do is, um, I'm not going to show the derivations here, but I would just wanna show a relationship. So more noise that you add here, so this, uh, this epsilon p is going to be uh, smaller. So in other words, you're going to have a hot better in terms of the, uh, the privacy. So just want to show this relationship. So, and this is a one over square root type of relationship. So, and, uh, and the next thing that we're going to do is we want to create some cost functions so that we can connect these two components together. And, uh, and we have a user sitting down here and learners uh, sitting uh, up there. And learner can also perturb and the, uh, the user can also perturb. So in some way, it's kind of intuitive uh, that if I know that my le the learner is going to perturb the data, is going to make the, uh, the entire system privacy preserving, I can just submit my data 
uh, to you because you are going to uh, perturb the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the result and uh, make it a differential private. private. And uh, if not, then I have to perturb myself because if I do not trust you uh, in that way, then I have to do something in, uh, here so that you, uh, you will get uh, uh, um, the, the, the perturbed data and then you will learn based on this perturbed data. So, and here is the utility function that we create for the, this, this learner here. This learner is going to, there is some, um, the maximum uh, benefits down there. And this is the, this is the accuracy, obviously higher this, um, higher the, uh, the, the perturbation, you're actually gonna create, uh, the, the higher the perturbation here, you are going to create uh, uh, less accuracy. So, so here, this is going to be the cost of accuracy. And here is, here is the, the cost of the, uh, the privacy. And then there's also a cost of uh, perturbation. So if we put these things together, let's see um, what we're gonna have at equilibrium. So the equilibrium concept that we're gonna use is what we call a staggered equilibrium. It is, it's, it is basically equilibrium says that, well, let's say the learner is gonna announce something and then I'm gonna see how the, uh, rev uh, the, the users are gonna to respond to it. It's like the, there's a leader uh, sits down up there and says, okay, this is the policy I'm going to uh, um, tax you. Uh, this is the, uh, my tax policy. Now the next question, once you see that, then you ask yourself, what, how should I respond to that tax policy? So in other words, this is the, uh, how the users are going to respond to this learner. And, uh, and then putting them together, which I'm not going to describe to clear, uh, to, to, uh, in detail, is going to give you the, um, uh, the Staggleberg equilibrium. So, and this is, has, some, it has some analogies to prism